Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 6, Demystifying the Internet, Part 1 of 3. What is the Internet, really? And how does it work? Addressing these questions now will help you to understand some of the security vulnerabilities that we will discuss in later lessons. To begin, imagine for a moment that you live in a world with computers, but without the Internet. Imagine that you are, say, a physicist, and imagine that you use your laboratory computer to collect and store data from your physics experiments. Now imagine that several of your co-workers, fellow physicists and lab assistants, require access to your data as well. Now, one way to grant your co-workers access to this data is to let them use your computer. Sharing computers is nice as far as it goes, but it has some obvious limitations. For example, what could happen if everybody needed to use the computer at the same time? Because it's not always practical to share computers, you and your coworkers would probably look for some way to share the data itself instead. You could copy the data onto disks or flash drives and walk it over to your coworkers' workstations, but that too would have some obvious limitations, especially if some of your coworkers' workstations were on another floor of your building, or maybe even in a different building altogether. Another way to share data would be to network your computers together, allowing them to share data directly. Such a method could allow thousands of users to share huge stores of information almost immediately across a large number of individual workstations. Indeed, this is what countless organizations have chosen to do. Most companies and large organizations have some kind of computer network. An organization with a computer network enjoys many advantages over an organization with unconnected computers. For example, networked computers make it easier to access, distribute, and back up important information. They can provide users the flexibility to log into their workstation or into their network account from multiple locations. And networks allow users to connect individual workstations to some kind of central work hub, such as a printer and copy center or a conference room. So now let's imagine that you and your physicist coworkers have developed a computer network that allows you to share important data with users across your organization. Furthermore, let's imagine that another group of physicists on the other side of town also works on their own network of computers. It's easy to imagine that these two groups of physicists would know each other and they might naturally be interested in each other's research. So maybe they would get together, and maybe they would decide that it would be mutually beneficial if they could join their networks together into one big data sharing network. When multiple networks join together like this into a network of networks, that is called internetworking. The internet is one giant piece of internetworking. It's a network of many computer networks, all internetworked together. The internet is not the only example of internetworking, but it's the biggest example in the world, and as you know, it's the one that you are most likely to interact with on a daily basis. When you begin to network large numbers of computers together, you need increasingly complex systems of cables and data transfer devices to keep this network connected together. When these networks connect diverse people, organizations, and business interests over a large geographic area, a few important questions naturally arise. One is, who owns the networking devices that make the internet possible, and who is responsible for fixing them when they break? The short answer is that organizations called Internet Service Providers, or ISPs, own and maintain the physical networking cables and networking devices that facilitate the internet. And who are the Internet Service Providers, you might ask? They are mostly big private companies, such as Time Warner or Comcast, while some others are government agencies. Another question that's useful to answer is this. How do computers communicate across the network? For computers to communicate with each other, they need a well-defined set of communication rules. That's because computer messages have precise, unambiguous meaning. We humans are used to dealing with ambiguity. If we hear an ambiguous sentence from another human, we can ask for clarification, or we might make an educated guess at what the person meant to say. But computers don't work this way. Computers need precise, unchanging, and unambiguous rules in order to communicate well with each other. Any strict, fixed set of communications rules is called a communications protocol. In order to network computers together, the computers on the network must share a common protocol. 
And as you could probably guess, in order to internetwork multiple networks together, these networks must also agree on a common internetworking protocol. Every device that is networked together on the internet uses a particular protocol called internet protocol, which is usually abbreviated IP. One of the features of internet protocol, which will come up later in this course, is that internet protocol requires a unique address called an IP address for every device that is connected to the internet. All of the web pages, files, and software that is accessible on the internet has to be stored on some kind of device that's connected to the network. Every time one device requests a file from another device on the internet, it needs to specify where the file is stored. Now, IP addresses allow devices to do that. And whenever that data request is fulfilled, the device providing the data needs to know which other device it's supposed to deliver the data to. Again, IP addresses allow devices to do that. Running the internet without IP addresses would be a little like running the postal service without mailing addresses. So, in summary, the internet is a vast network of other networks all networked together. Internet service providers, or ISPs, are the organizations that own the cables and networking devices that the internet runs on. Computers need strict sets of communication rules, called protocols, in order to communicate with each other, and the communications protocol of the internet is called internet protocol, or IP. Finally, every device on the internet gets its own IP address. That's all for now, and the next lesson we'll discuss how the internet is structured and how IP addresses get assigned to all those devices on the internet.